we were just discussing, uh, uh, Gary, about the importance of not having silos when it comes to not only to the sustainability, but in general in the education. That is a bit of our heritage. And talking about that, you are the president of the World Academy of Art and Sciences. And we were discussing about the importance of the integration of the two worlds. So what's your, um, what's your perspective when it comes to the skills of the future, thinking of the combination of the, how we can complement art and science and influence the skills of the futures? We're at an unprecedented moment in human history where after thousands of years of evolution, we are threatening to outgrow planet and undermine the planet that we have been born on. And clearly that means that it's not the planet that's going to change or has to change, it's we who have to change. And they, the, the best, the most powerful system we have for affecting change, evolution of society, is really our educational system. Uh, and our educa the problems we have today are a product of an educational system developed over hundreds of years where we looked at reality in terms of separate compartments. And it's hard for us to believe today that we had an economic science for two centuries that ignored the environment. Uh, but that was true. And it's not just true of economics. It's true that we had divided reality into so many different pieces. That's not my responsibility. Uh, and uh, recently we had a meeting with IEEE, mm -hmm. uh, with the leaders in artificial intelligence, and we asked them, I'm, recently I'm talking about five years ago, before <laughs> COVID, today it, I hope it would be different. Yes. And we asked them, how much are your engineers learning about the impact of technology on society and about how society works and what, the oh, that's not part of the education. Five years ago, it was a meeting in Italy, in fact. Uh, it was an international meeting. I'm not to know. But I think it, it showed something was missing. Yes. Our academy was founded in 1960 by very eminent intellectuals like Einstein, Bertrand Russell, and Robert Oppenheimer, who was the father of the Manhattan mm -hmm. Project and the atomic bomb. And very soon after they developed this, thinking they were doing the science, for the cause of humanity, they were faced with the dilemma that they may have unleashed the Pandora into Pandora's yeah. box that could destroy humanity. And they realized nothing in their education, nothing in their training had prepared them for the social consequences and policy implications of what they had developed. And that was why the academy is founded. Fast forward today, we've got AI. And at least it's a little more encouraging today, though it's frightening, that it's the leaders of AI, it's the leaders of technology development who are speaking out and warning the world, uh, governments, that we have to do something about it. Well, I think that's the issue with climate change. Uh, today, who's responsible for climate change? I would turn it around and say, is there any discipline, any educational discipline that should not be concerned? with climate change and should not be educating us and looking at from their point of view, whether it's econ economics or business or technology or the arts, the communication uh, uh, fields and all, I think we have to accept the fact that we have to educate people hmm. to live in this complex world and be global citizens. It means they need a lot more knowledge than the specialized knowledge that comes from disciplinary perspectives. And I'll just end with that. One of our founders was Buckminster Fuller. And some 40 years ago, he said that the, the disciplinary silos are the Absolutely. source of all the problems yes. that, that face humanity. And therefore, without fundamental change in the way we think and the way we educate uh, and the way we raise the next generation, we're not going to be able to solve these problems. Probably, as you are saying, really the sustainability should be the common aspect underpin each and every of our uh, education of our uh, curriculum because it's, it's our future it's our planet if we do not take care and here we have a fantastic uh, image of how our uh, <laughs> marble glass uh, blue glass that is the 
uh, the planet Earth. If we do not take care of each of us, it's going to be really going to be. And we, I mean, the uh, again, the educational institution, the academy, how can inspire the next generation to combine the creativity, the, know, the technical knowledge, in order really to, and even the critical thinking, that's an important aspect, because we really need to, your point, we need to continuously um, question what we are doing and challenge ourselves to do something different, having in mind what is the big, big goal that is our sustainable future. A great question, though. Uh, I think the first thing we need is a fundamental change in asking ourselves, what is the purpose of education and what are we trying to educate? Hmm. And what we're calling for is a shift from subject-centered education to a person-centered education. We need to be educating individual people to live in the future society. And it, it's not just that everybody should do their technical job or their professional job well. We have to be if we have to be members of society. We have to be members of yes. on the planet, and our education is training us for specialized work at a time when we need to be trained to live, and and live in a sustainable way, and live in a harmonious way, and understand other people and other cultures, and that's quite a. Hmm. The reversal of direction to where we have been going in in recent decades, more and more specialized, more and more technical, as if the technology alone is going to solve all our problems. But it's the attitudes, it's the knowledge, the it's the values. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our science developed as a reaction to the religious values of 500 years ago, and we wanted to pride ourselves on our objectivity. But the values of the individual are absolutely going to determine uh, the, f the future of the world. And that's what I was illustrating with the founding of the academy. The scientists realize it doesn't matter how good we are at nuclear fission. It matters how good we are at valuing humanity and the survival of the planet and not just our career advancement, but our contribution to humanity. That's one. The second one I'd say is really important is we need an education that's really life-centered. And I don't mean that it includes life. I mean it's centered in life. And part of the problem we have with specialization is that it assumes that, we, that life is organized in com compartments, airtight compartments. But all of us know in life, it, you cannot, dis this thing, you cannot uh, divide uh, any part of the life from the other. Uh, recently, I was addressing a, a European conference of public health workers uh, and, uh, and what they can be doing. And I said, I want to talk about climate and, uh, and health. And I cited the data from the World Health Organization that climate is the single greatest danger to the health of people on the planet. And they all shook their head and said, yeah, yeah, the climate scientists should do something about this. And at the end of my talk, I said, I think it's the health workers who should do something about this. You cannot uh, cure, you cannot solve a problem unless we create, we prevent it. And all the data shows that the public health workers, the medical profession is the most trusted profession in the world, universally. And it's also the one that's got the closest relationship with the public. Uh, our climate scientists, who are so important in the world, but they, they're looking at the stars or they're measuring the atmosphere. They don't have much contact with the general public. And what we need to be able to utilize that trust that, uh, that's there in the medical profession. So I said, instead of figuring out how you're going to solve the problem of health when the climate gets hotter, what are you going to do to stop and prevent? Uh, and there was a look of bewilderment. On, That's not our job. It's, it's everybody's job to stop the climate change. And you, the public health workers, the medical profession has a tremendous potential, but we've kind of been educated into the compartment. So when I say life-centered, let's look for all of us. What is the reality out there? And instead of saying, I'm in this division, this hole or that cupboard or that silo or something like that, 
what is my contribution I can make? And that's what we were asking the educators six months ago. It doesn't matter whether you're in the arts. If you're in the arts, what are you doing? What can you do? Or in cinema, what can you be doing to create awareness in the world about the challenges, not only of climate change, but certainly that's the number one uh, threat before us today. Uh, whether you're in a, uh, uh, doing an MBA in management or in ed economics or in literature, there's no discipline that cannot be contributing to the reality of the world we live in. And so I think we need to make life the center rather than the discipline. Make the person the center rather than the subject. It goes a ways toward, toward focusing us on, on helping to raise the next generation, which is a lot more in touch with reality than we have been up until now. And uh, Gary, I think that you touched some very crucial point because I asked you about what could inspire the next generation. I think if we could have like one common shared value, that is our planet, the future of our planet, this could help automatically even to overcome the silos approach because we were all together, we would be all together towards a common goal, which is way bigger than what we are doing now, way bigger value than what we are doing. Gary, we have been talking about the importance of the intersection of art, science, and even climate actions. Which are the exciting possibilities and even challenges that you foresee in this intersection? The, the idea that art and science are somehow dealing with different realities or different worlds, uh, I think is part of the problem that we need to overcome. Uh, that the science focuses on the objective, measurable, quantifiable, dimensions of reality and we try to look at for algorithms that will capture them. The arts try to reflect the subjective nature of reality, which is what motivates human beings to act. Now we're in a situation in the world where we've got all the objective data of science to tell us that we're on a collision course with the future. And yet, we know collectively that we're still not doing what we need to do, that the emotional commitment of humanity, of our leadership, in all areas, we, can, we have outstanding examples of individuals and organizations that are pioneering in new ways. But this is a global issue, and it can't be done just by political figures who have to ultimately be elected by the public. Uh, it can't be done just by business leaders who are accountable to their shareholders. It's got to be Collective. by Collective. collectively of humanity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think the sustainability, what was said about sustainability is absolutely right and true. But we have to ask a question. Is that what's going to motivate humanity to take the, the, ch the fundamental changes they have to make? Uh, mm -hmm. We had the... Uh, Rajendra Pachuri, who was the chairman of the IPCC. He was on our board. Uh, he was, for 13 years, he was the chairman of IPCC, and we, and he made wonderful analysis, as the IPCC has done, to the world of the facts. The question is, who is it reaching? And how much is it motivating global society to change in all fields, even in education, which is what we've been discussing. And that's why uh, the focus we have been taking is put the in the human individual at what does this mean to people? Okay, CO2 levels are going up and uh, migration will be there and uh, jobs will be lost or something will be happening. But people respond to their needs. Mm -hmm. And when we look at climate in terms of its impact on people, in terms of food security, in terms of health, which we've been discussing, uh, in terms of the, uh, the stability of jobs in the economy and the political system, which is now being divided by polar forces and everything, uh, climate becomes not just for the sustainability of the planet, for it becomes one. for each individual. Each and so what I, when I talk about life-centered, mm -hmm. what I really meant is 
person-centered, the message should touch each person as what it means to them. Mm. And it's great to hear that the physicians, you know, are are doing they're doing a wonderful work in the world, even uh, as as always. But reaching out and touching the human the, the society that's what we haven't done as effectively as we can, in spite of wonderful efforts all along. So I think when we talk about arts, what we're really talking about is how important is our knowledge and our skill and our capacity to communicate with others, not just in terms of marketing, but in terms of understanding and reaching them to the point where they will understand and act. And the arts mm. represent, whether it's literature or cinema uh, or, uh, or in any of the arts, it has been the, the, the field in which human beings have shown their capacity to communicate their humanity and move other people to action by that. And just to take a superficial mm -hmm. example, which many of you may know, uh, a few years ago, UNDP developed this video on the dinosaur talking about extinction, <laughs> a 90 second video. And it was put on the UN mm -hmm. site website alongside a speech by the Secretary General. Uh, and after a few months, the Secretary General had had three 30,000 viewers, mm -hmm. and the dinosaur had had one and a half million. <laughs> and that message, I love it. you know, so, Says a lot. so the arts are mm -hmm. as much a part of us. They are, are mm -hmm. they, they address our inside, and that's what we need to do better uh, if we're going to mobilize the magnitude and speed of change we need. We have to have a message that reaches everybody. And our artists of all description, not I don't mean just fine artists or uh, are in the widest sense, those who are who understand how to communicate to other people the, the most important things in the world in our lives, uh, that's what we need to change. And I love very much your answer because it brings us to a different perspective. Because you are saying, yes, important the communication. Yes, important the collaboration, but let's use a different language. Let's use a language that really can reach out everyone. And art could be the vehicle because we keep to think of the, the more of the, uh, say the technology, but yes, as a technology, as the vehicle to communicate. Rather, you are bringing us back to the value of the art as the way to communicate with the humans, because at the end, it's all about humans. What we are talking about. I love it. I believe that we have all the right ingredients to change our future. We just we just need to communicate more, collaborate more, and have a joint, common, bigger value. It is our future. And with that, I want to thank you for being here today and this audience as well. It was a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much.